Tech TV US Canada brings you news and views from White House and State Department's press briefings. Sarah Sanders, White House Press Secretary. Heather Neward, the spokesperson for the US Department of State. Nikki Haley, US Ambassador to the United Nations. touch on uh, on this issue in particular uh, we are committed to protecting and promoting the exercise of freedom of expression by advancing and advocating for free press around the world we continue to engage governments to address specific cases of abuses against journalists and on laws and practices that unduly restrict freedom of expression. At the United Nations Human Rights Council, the UN General Assembly, the United States sponsors and supports resolutions calling for the promotion and protection of freedom of expression and the safety of journalists both online and offline. We continue to engage with and support the mandate for the UN Special Rapporteur and Freedom of Opinion and Expression. We are a leading voice in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, in defense of freedom of expression both online and offline, and support the OSCE's representative on freedom of the media. In Burma, for example, we have repeatedly raised our concerns at the highest levels of that government with plans to charge two Reuters reporters under the Official Secrets Act. We urgently call for their immediate and unconditional release. In China, we've repeatedly called on authorities to unblock U.S. media websites, eliminate restrictions that impede the ability of journalists to practice their profession, and allow all individuals in China to express their views without fear of retribution. In Turkey, we remain seriously concerned about the widespread arrest and pretrial detention of journalists critical of the Turkish government. We urge Turkey to end its state of emergency, respect and ensure freedom of expression, fair trial guarantee, judicial independence and other human rights and fundamental freedoms and release those journalists and others who are held arbitrarily under emergency rule. In Pakistan, and this is something new that's taking place now, we are very concerned about the Pakistani Ministry of Interior's decision to close the offices of Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Liberties, Radio Marshal in Islamabad on January 19th. We have conveyed our concerns to the government of Pakistan and we urge Pakistan to swiftly and unequivocally revoke the closure decision and restore Radio Marshal's operations. The Sudanese government uh, must improve its performance in protecting fundamental freedom of expression. The United States condemns the recent has harassment, the arbitrary detention, and attacks on journalists in their country simply for doing their job. The negative trends reflect continued actions by governments to stifle dissent and increase government control over free expression in print and online. The United States supports freedom of expression, including for members of freedom of the press, and fundamental to any democracy. We, iterate, we re reiterate that the same rights of individuals have offline must also be protected online, in particular freedom of expression. Uh, thank you for... Thank you for allowing me to do that. I'm uh, proud of the work that all of you do. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention, and that is uh, a private partnership that the United States government has with uh, you, uh, between USAID, one of our sister agencies, and also the company MasterCard. Yesterday, the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, the administrator, Mark Green, and MasterCard Executive Pri Vice President of Public-Private Partnerships, Tara Nathan, co-launched, co-chaired the launch of the Smart Communities Coalition at the World Economic Forum in Davos. It's a new coalition that will address technology challenges that refugees and host communities face and increase their internet connectivity, digital payment capabilities, and energy access within refugee settlements. Power Africa, that is a U.S. government-led initiative coordinated by USAID, will spearhead efforts to provide energy access to refugees in a more cost-efficient manner, and USAID's Global Development Lab and other partners will increase internet and mobile connectivity. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Nikolai, for the briefing that you gave. During the past year, as the representative of the United States, I have most often taken the position that this monthly session on the Middle East is miscast. As I've pointed out many times, this session spends far too much time on Israel and the Palestinians and far too little time on the terrorist regimes and groups that undermine peace and security in the region, chief among them Iran, ISIS, Hezbollah, and Hamas. That remains my view, 
and I expect that in future months I will continue to focus on those threats from the Middle East that draw too little attention at the UN. However, today I will set aside my usual practice. Today, I too will focus on the issue of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. What has changed? The events of the past month have shed light on a critical aspect of the Israeli-Palestinian problem, and it is important that we do not miss the opportunity here at the UN to bring attention to it. The aspect I will address is the single most critical element to achieving peace. No, it's not the issues of security, borders, refugees, or settlements. All of those are important parts of a peace agreement. But the single most important element is not any of those. The indispensable element is leaders who have the will to do what's needed to achieve peace. Real peace requires leaders who are willing to step forward, acknowledge hard truths, and make compromises. It requires leaders who look to the future rather than dwell on past resentments. Above all, such leaders require courage. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was such a leader. Forty years ago, President Sadat did an exceptional thing. Egypt and Israel were still in a state of war. In fact, Sadat himself had led Egypt in war with Israel only a few years before. But Sadat made the courageous decision to pursue peace. And when he made that decision, he went to Jerusalem and delivered a speech before the Israeli Knesset. That he went to the Knesset was courageous in itself. But what took real courage was what he said there. Sadat did not go to Jerusalem on bended knee. He spoke in no uncertain terms about the hard concessions he expected from the Israelis. And then he said the words that both he and the world knew marked a turning point. He said to the Israeli legislators, quote, you want to live with us in this part of the world. In all sincerity, I tell you, we welcome you among us with full security and safety. We used to reject you, he said. Yet today I tell you, and declare it to the whole world that we accept to live with you in permanent peace based on justice. These were the words that led to peace between Egypt and Israel. It was not an easy process. It took another 16 months of tough negotiations to reach a peace treaty, and both sides made difficult compromises. But Sadat's words helped make Israel understand that it had a partner with whom it could make those painful compromises. Some have said that these were the words that got Anwar Sadat killed. But no one can question the generations of Egyptians and Israeli citizens that have enjoyed a peace that has stood the test of time. Compare those words to what Palestinian President Abbas said to the PLO Central Council 11 days ago. In his speech, President Abbas declared the landmark Oslo Peace Accords dead. He rejected any American role in peace talks. He insulted the American president. He called for suspending recognition of Israel. He invoked an ugly and fictional past, reaching back to the 17th century to paint Israel as a colonialist project engineered by European powers. Once more, Let's contrast Sadat's words with Abbas's. President Sadat acknowledged that some Arab leaders did not agree with him, but he told them it was his responsibility to, quote, exhaust all and every means in a bid to save my Egyptian Arab people and the entire Arab nation, the horrors of new, shocking, and destructive wars. President Abbas also acknowledged criticism from other Arab leaders, and he too had a message for them. His response was, get lost. Curiously, President Abbas's speech has gotten little attention in the media. I encourage anyone who cares about the cause of a durable and just peace in the Middle East to read President Abbas's speech for yourself. 
a speech that indulges in outrageous and discredited conspiracy theories is not the speech of a person with the courage and the will to seek peace. Despite all of this, the United States remains fully prepared and eager to pursue peace. We have done nothing to prejudge the final borders of Jerusalem. We have done nothing to alter the status of the holy sites. We remain committed to the possibility and potential of two states, if agreed to by the parties. Just as it did with Egypt, peace requires compromise. It requires solutions that take into account the core interests of all sides. And that is what the United States is focused on for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Hate-filled speeches and end runs around negotiations take us nowhere. Ultimately, peace will not be achieved without leaders with courage. King Hussein of Jordan was another such leader. In 1994, he ended 46 years of war and entered into a peace agreement with Israel that holds to this day. When King Hussein signed the peace treaty, he said this, quote, These are moments in which we live, the past and the future. When we come to live next to each other, as never before, we will be doing so, Israelis and Jordanians, together, without the need for any to observe our actions or supervise our endeavors. This is peace with dignity. This is peace with commitment." End quote. I ask here today, where is the Palestinian President, where is the Palestinian King Hussein? Where is the Palestinian Anwar Sadat? If President Abbas demonstrates he can be that type of leader, we would welcome it. His recent actions demonstrate the total opposite. The United States remains deeply committed to helping the Israelis and the Palestinians reach a historic peace agreement that brings a better future to both peoples just as we did successfully with the Egyptians and the Jordanians. But we will not chase after a Palestinian leadership that lacks what, needs, what is needed to achieve peace. To get historic results, we need courageous leaders. History has provided such leaders in the past. For the sake of the Palestinian and Israeli people, we pray it does so again. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The president, a uh, couple of updates here before we get started. The president has been briefed on the shooting at Marshall County High School in Kentucky. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and families there, and we offer our sincerest appreciation to the heroic Marshall County deputy who apprehended the shooter. A few more updates before we bring up a couple of special guests. Uh, I'd like to leave no, no doubt where the White House stands uh, on the Flake, Graham, and Dermot Agreement on Immigration Reform. In the bipartisan meeting here at the White House two weeks ago, we outlined a path forward on four issues. Serious border security, an end to chain migration, the cancellation of the outdated and unsafe visa lottery, and a permanent solution to DACA. Unfortunately, the Flake-Graham-Durban agreement does not meet these benchmarks. In fact, it would not secure our border, encourage more illegal immigration, increase chain migration, and retain the visa lottery system. In short, it's totally unacceptable to the president and should be declared dead on arrival. The president has been extraordinarily consistent on the immigration and what his priorities are. His views are shared by the vast majority of the American people and have bipartisan support in the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. Moving along, we have some incredible economic news to share today. J.P. Morgan Chase announced this morning that because of the Trump tax cuts, they will raise wages for 22,000 of their employees, create thousands of new jobs, and increase small business by lending $4 billion. In total, these moves are part of a $20 billion investment plan for which J.P. Morgan Chase directly credits the passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as well as the President's historic efforts to rolling back job-killing regulations. Also, Disney announced that over 125,000 employees will receive a $1,000 cash bonus, and the company is investing $50 million into a new employee education program. 
Lastly, Verizon announced today that all of their employees, other than the top management, will receive 50 shares of restricted stock. This amounts to about $2,500 per employee. Employees will further share in the company's success, Verizon said in a release. We're only one year in, and the president is just getting started. But we're pleased to see that our great American workers and families are already feeling the positive effects of the president's policies. As you know, the president will be traveling to the World Economic Forum later this week, so I brought in a couple of special guests to preview that trip. NEC Director Gary Cohn, who played a major role in the tax reform effort, and National Security Advisor General H.R. McMaster will discuss the trip and answer questions specific to that topic, and then I will be up with more information and to take your questions. Thanks. General. I'm not general. I might be general. In general. In general. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see everyone. Tag TV US Canada brings you news and views from White House and State Department's press briefings. Sarah Sanders, White House Press Secretary. Heather Neward, the spokesperson for the US Department of State. Nikki Haley, US Ambassador to the United Nations. 